Chapter 29. A costly mistake. In the morning, Aragon and Bronn retrieved their saddlebags from the stable and prepared to depart. Jode greeted Bronn while Helen watched from the doorway. With grave looks, the two men clasped hands. I'll miss you, old man, said Jode. And I, you, said Bronn thickly. He bowed his white head and then turned to Helen. Thank you for your hospitality. It was most gracious. Her face reddened. Aragon thought she was going to slap him. Brom continued, unperturbed. You have a good husband. Take care of him. There are few men as brave and as determined as he is, but even he cannot weather difficult times without support from those he loves. He bowed again and said gently, Only a suggestion, dear lady. Aragon watched as indignation and hurt crossed Helen's face. Her eyes flashed as she shut the door brusquely. Sighing, Jode ran his fingers through his hair. Aragon thanked him for all his help, then mounted Caddock. With the last farewell said, he and Brom departed. At Tiam's south gate, the guards let them through without a second glance. As they rode under the giant outer wall, Aragon saw movement in the shadow. Solombon was crouched on the ground, tail twitching. The werecat followed them with inscrutable eyes. As the city receded into the distance, Aragon asked, What are werecats? Brom looked surprised at the question. Why the sudden curiosity? I, I heard someone mention them in Diem. They're not real, are they? said Aragon, pretending ignorance. They are quite real. During the riders' years of glory, they were as renowned as the dragons. Kings and elves kept them as companions. Yet the werecats were free to do what they chose. Very little has ever been known about them. I'm afraid that their race has become rather scarce recently. Could they use magic? asked Aragon. No one's sure, but they could certainly do unusual things. They always seemed to know what was going on, and somehow or another managed to get themselves involved. Brom pulled his hood up to block a chill wind. What's Helgrind? asked Aragon, after a moment's thought. You'll see when we get to Drasliona. When Tiam was out of sight, Aragon reached out with his mind and called, Sephira! The force of his mental shout was so strong that Caddock flicked his ears in annoyance. Sephira answered and sped toward them with all of her strength. Aragon and Brom watched as a dark blur rushed from a cloud, then heard a dull roar as Sephira's wings flared open. The sun shone behind the thin membranes, turning them translucent and silhouetting the dark veins. She landed with a blast of air. Aragon tossed Caddock's reins to Brom. I'll join you for lunch. Brom nodded, but seemed preoccupied. Have a good time, he said, then looked at Sephira and smiled. It's good to see you again. And you too. Aragon hopped onto Sephira's shoulders. They held on tightly as she bounded upward. With the wind at her tail... Sophia sliced through the air. Hold on, she warned Aragon. Then, letting out a wild bugle, she soared in a great loop. Aragon yelled with excitement as he flung his arms in the air, holding on only with his legs. I didn't know I could stay on while you did that, without being strapped into the saddle, he said, grinning fiercely. Neither did I, admitted Sophia, laughing in her peculiar way. Aragon hugged her tightly, and they flew a level path. Masters of the sky. By noon, his legs were sore from riding bareback, and his hands and face were numb from the cold air. Sephira's scales were always warm to the touch, but she could not keep him from getting chilled. When they landed for lunch, he buried his hands in his clothes and found a warm, sunny place to sit. As he and Brom ate, Aragon asked Sephira, Do you mind if I ride Caddock? He had decided to question Brom further about his past. No, but tell me what he says. Aragon was not surprised that Sophia knew his plans. It was nearly impossible to hide anything from her when they were mentally linked. 
When they finished eating, she flew away as he joined Brom on the trail. After a time, Aragorn slowed Caddock and said, I need to talk to you. I wanted to do it when we first arrived in Tiam, but I decided to wait until now. About what? asked Brom. Aragorn paused. There's a lot going on that I don't understand. For instance, who are your friends, and why were you hiding in Carvajal? I trust you with my life, which is why I'm still travelling with you. But I need to know more about who you are, and what you're doing. What did you steal in Gilead? And what is the Twatha do other thing that you're taking me through? I think, after all that's happened, I, I deserve an explanation. You eavesdropped on us. Only once, said Eberdon. I see that you have yet to learn proper manners, said Brom grimly, tugging on his beard. What makes you think that this concerns you? Nothing really, said Aragorn, shrugging. Just, it's an odd coincidence that you happen to be hiding in Carvajal when I found Sophia's egg, and that you also know so much dragon lore. The more I think about it, the less likely it seems. There were other clues that I mostly ignored, but they're obvious now that I look back. Like how you knew of the rack in the first place, and why they ran away when you approached. And I can't help but wonder if you had something to do with the appearance of Sophia's egg. There's a lot you haven't told us, and Sophia and I can't afford to ignore anything that might be dangerous. Dark lines appeared on Brom's forehead as he rained Snowfire to a halt. You won't wait? he asked. Aragorn shook his head mulishly. Brom sighed. Ah, this wouldn't be a problem if you weren't so suspicious, but I suppose that you wouldn't be worth my time if you were otherwise. Aragorn was unsure if he should take that as a compliment. Brom lit his pipe and slowly blew a plume of smoke into the air. I'll tell you, he said, but you have to understand that I cannot reveal everything. Aragorn started to protest, but Brom cut him off. It's not out of a desire to withhold information, but because I won't give away secrets that aren't mine. There are other stories woven in with this narrative. You'll have to talk with the others involved to find out the rest. Very well. Explain what you can, said Aragorn. Are you sure? asked Brom. There are reasons for my secretiveness. I've tried to protect you by shielding you from forces that would tear you apart. Once you know of them and their purposes, you'll never have the chance to live quietly. You will have to choose sides and make a stand. Do you really want to know? I cannot live my life in ignorance, said Aragorn quietly. A worthy goal. Very well. There is a war raging in Alagazia between the Varden and the Empire. Their conflict, however, reaches far beyond any incidental armed clashes. They are locked in a titanic power struggle, centred around you. Me, said Aragorn, disbelieving. That's impossible. I don't have anything to do with either of them. Not yet, said Brom. But your very existence is the focus of their battles. The Varden and the Empire aren't fighting to control this land or its people. Their goal is to control the next generation of riders, of whom you are the first. Whoever controls these riders will become the undisputed master of Alagaesia. Aragorn tried to absorb Brom's statements. It seemed incomprehensible that so many people would be interested in him and Sephira. No one besides Brom had thought that he was important. The whole concept of the Empire and Varden fighting over him was too abstract for him to grasp fully. Objections quickly formed in his mind. But, but all the riders were killed except for the Force One, who joined Galbatorix. As far as I know, even those are now dead. And you told me in Carvajal that no one knows if there are still dragons in Alagaesia. I lied about the dragons, said Brom flatly. Even though the riders are gone, there are still three dragon eggs left, all of them in Galmatorix's possession. Actually, there are only two now, since Sapphira hatched. The king salvaged the three during his last great battle with the riders. So there may soon be two new riders, both of them loyal to the king? asked Aragorn with a sinking feeling. 
Exactly, said Brom. There is a deadly race in progress. Galamat's Oryx is desperately trying to find the people for whom his eggs will hatch, while the Varden are employing every means to kill his candidates or steal the eggs. But where did Sephira's egg come from? How could anyone have got it away from the king? And why do you know all of this? asked Aragorn, bewildered. So many questions, laughed Brom bitterly. There is another chapter to all of this, one that took place long before you were born. Back then, I was a bit younger, though perhaps not as wise. I hated the Empire, for reasons I'll keep to myself, and wanted to damage it in any way I could. My fervor led me to a scholar, Jode, who claimed to have discovered a book that showed a secret passageway into Galvatorix's castle. I eagerly brought Joe to the Varden, who are my friends, who are and they arranged to have the eggs stolen. The Varden? However, something went amiss, and our thief got only one egg. For some reason, he fled with it and didn't return to the Varden. When he wasn't found, Joe and I were sent to bring him and the egg back. Brom's eyes grew distant, and he spoke in a curious voice. That was the start of one of the greatest searches in history. We raced against the Ravak and Morzan, last of the Forsworn, and the king's finest servant. Morzan? interrupted Aragorn. But he was the one who betrayed the rider Sir Galbatorix. And that happened so long ago. Morzan must have been ancient. It disturbed him to be reminded of how long riders lived. So? asked Brom raising an eyebrow. Yes, he was old, but strong and cruel. He was one of the king's first followers, and by far his most loyal. As there had been blood between us before, the hunt for the egg turned into a personal battle. When it was located in Gilead, I rushed there and fought Morzan for possession. It was a terrible contest, but in the end, I slew him. During the conflict, I was separated from Jode. There was no time to search for him, so I took the egg and bore it to the Varden, who asked me to train whomever became the new rider. I agreed and decided to hide in Carvajal, which I had been to several times before, until the Varden contacted me. I was never summoned. Then how did Sophia's egg appear in the spine? Was another one stolen from the king? asked Aragorn. Brum grunted. Small chance of that. He has the remaining two guarded so thoroughly that it would be suicide to try and steal them. No, Safira was taken from the Varden, and I think I know how. To protect the egg, his guardian must have tried to send it to me with magic. The Varden haven't contacted me to explain how they lost the egg, so, so I suspect that their runners were intercepted by the Empire, and that Azak was sent in their place. I'm sure they were quite eager to find me as I've managed to foil many of their plans. Then the Razak didn't know about me when they arrived in Carvel, said Aragorn with wonder. That's right, replied Bron. If that ass Sloan had kept his mouth shut, they might not have found out about you. Events could have turned out quite differently. In a way, I have you to thank for my life. If the Razak hadn't been so preoccupied with you, they might have caught me unawares. And that would have been the end of Brom, the storyteller. The only reason they ran was because I'm stronger than the two of them, especially during the day. They must have planned to drug me during the night, then question me about the egg. You sent a message to the Varden, telling them about me? Yes. I'm sure they'll want to bring you to them as soon as possible. But you're not going to, are you? Brom shook his head. No. I'm not. Why not? Being with the Varden must be safer than chasing after the Razak, especially for a new rider. Brom snorted and looked at Aragorn with fondness. The Varden are dangerous people. If we go to them, you will be entangled in their politics and machinations. Their leaders may send you on missions just to make a point, even though you might not be strong enough for them. I want you to be well prepared before you go anywhere near the Varden. At least, while we pursue the Razak, 
I don't have to worry about someone poisoning your water. This is the lesser of two evils. And, he said with a smile, it keeps you happy while I train you. Tuatha Duara Thrim is just a stage in your instruction. I will help you find, and perhaps even kill, the Razak, for they are as much my enemies as yours. But then you will have to make a choice. And that would be, asked Aragon warily. Whether to join the Varden, said Bron. If you kill the Razak, the only way is for you to escape Galvatorix's wrath will be to seek the Varden's protection, flee to Suda, or plead for the king's mercy and join his forces. Even if you don't kill the Razak, you will still face this choice eventually. Aragorn knew the best way to gain sanctuary might be to join the Vard, but he did not want to spend his entire life fighting the Empire like they did. He mulled over Brom's comments, trying to consider them from every angle. You still didn't explain how you knew so much about dragons. No, I didn't, did I? said Brom with a crooked smile. That will have to wait for another time. Why me? Aragorn asked himself. What made him so special that he should become a rider? Did you ever meet my mother? He blurted. Brom looked grave. Yes, I did. What was she like? The old man sighed. She was full of dignity and pride, like Garrow. Ultimately, it was her downfall, but it was one of her greatest gifts nevertheless. She always helped the poor and the less fortunate, no matter what her situation. You knew her well? asked Aragorn, startled. Well enough to miss her when she was gone. As Caddock plodded along, Aragorn tried to recall when he had thought that Brom was just a scruffy old man who told stories. For the first time, Aragorn understood how ignorant he had been. He told Sephira what he had learned. She was intrigued by Brom's revelations, but recoiled from the thought of being one of Galvatorix's possessions. At last, she said, Aren't you glad that you didn't stay in Carvajal? Think of all the interesting experiences you would have missed. Aragorn groaned in mock distress. When they stopped for the day, Aragorn searched for water while Brom made dinner. He rubbed his hands together for warmth as he walked in a large circle, listening for a creek or spring. It was gloomy and damp between the trees. He found a stream away from the camp, then crouched on the bank and watched the water splash over the rocks, dipping in his fingertips. The icy mountain water swirled around his skin, numbing it. It doesn't care what happens to us, or anyone else, thought Aragorn. He shivered and stood. An unusual print on the opposing stream caught his attention. It was oddly shaped and very large. Curious, he jumped across the stream and onto a rock shelf. As he landed, his foot hit a patch of damp moss. He grabbed a branch for support, but it broke, and he thrust out his hand to break his fall. He felt his right wrist crack as he hit the ground. Pain lanced up his arm. A steady stream of curses came out from behind his clenched teeth as he tried not to howl. Half blind with pain, he killed on the ground, cradling his arm. Aragon! came Sophia's alarmed cry. What happened? Broke my wrist, did something stupid, fell. I'm coming, said Sophia. No, I can make it back. Don't come. Trees too close for wings. She sent him a brief image of her tearing the forest apart to get at him, then said, Hurry! Groaning, he staggered upright. The print was pressed deeply into the ground a few feet away. It was the mark of a heavy, nail-studded boot. Aragorn instantly remembered the tracks that had surrounded the pile of bodies in Yazarak. Urgle, he spat, wishing that Zadok was with him. He could not use his bow with only one hand. His head snapped up, and he shouted with his mind, Sephira! Urgos! Keep Brom safe! Aragorn leapt back over the stream and raced toward their camp, yanking out his hunting knife. He saw potential enemies behind every tree and bush. I hope there's only one, Urgil. He burst into the camp, ducking as Sephira's tail swung overhead. Stop! It's me! He yelled. Oops, said Sephira. 
Oops, said Safira. Her wings were folded in front of her chest like a wall. Oops, growled Aragon, running to her. You could have killed me. Where's Brom? I'm right here, snapped Brom's voice from behind Safira's wings. Tell your crazy dragon to release me. She won't listen to me. Let him go, said Aragon, exasperated. Didn't you tell him? No, she said sheepishly. You just said to keep him safe. She lifted her wings, and Brom stepped forward angrily. I found an Urgle footprint, and it's fresh. Brom immediately turned serious. Sat on the horses. We're leaving. He put out the fire, but Aragon did not move. What's wrong with your arm? My wrist is broken, he said, swaying. Brom cursed and saddled Caddock for him. He helped Aragon onto the horse and said, We have to put a splint on your arm as soon as possible. Try not to move your wrist until then. Aragon gripped the reins tightly with his left hand. Brom said to Safira, It's almost dark. You might as well fly right overhead. If Urgul show up, they'll think twice about attacking with you nearby. They'd better, or else they won't think again, remarked Safira as she took off. Light was disappearing quickly, and the horses were tired, but they spurred them on without respite. Aragon's wrist, swollen and red, continued to throb. A mile from the camp, Brom halted. Listen, he said. Aragon heard the faint call of a hunting horn behind them. As it fell silent, panic gripped him. They must have found where we were, said Brom, and probably Safira's tracks. They will chase us now. It's not in their nature to let prey escape. Then two horns winded. They were closer. A chill ran through Aragon. Our only chance is to run, said Brom. He raised his head to the sky, and his face blanked as he called Safira. She rushed out of the night sky and landed. Leave Caddock. Go with her. You'll be safer, commanded Brom. What about you? Aragon protested. I'll be fine. Now go! Unable to muster the energy to argue, Aragon climbed onto Safira while Brom lashed no fire and rode away with Caddock. Safira flew after him, flapping above the galloping horses. Aragon clung to Safira as best he could. He winced whenever her movements jostled his wrist. The horns blared nearby, bringing a fresh wave of terror. Brom crashed through the underbrush, forcing the horses to their limits. The horns trumpeted in unison close behind him. They were quiet. Minutes passed. Where are the Urgles? wondered Aragon. A horn sounded, this time in the distance. He sighed in relief, resting against the fever's neck, while on the ground Brom slowed his headlong rush. That was close, said Aragon. Yes, but we cannot stop until... Safira was interrupted as a horn blasted directly underneath them. Aragon jerked in surprise, and Brom resumed his frenzied retreat. Horned urgles, shouting with coarse voices, barreled along the trail on horses, swiftly gaining ground. They were almost in sight of Brom. The old man could not outrun them. We have to do something, exclaimed Aragon. What? Land in front of the urgles. Are you crazy? demanded Safira. Land! I know what I'm doing, said Aragon. There isn't time for anything else. They're going to overtake Brom. Very well, Safira pulled ahead of the Urgles, then turned, preparing to drop onto the trail. Aragon reached for his power and felt the familiar resistance in his mind that separated him from the magic. He did not try to breach it yet. A muscle twitched in his neck. As the Urgles pounded up the trail, he shouted, Now! Safira abruptly folded her wings and dropped straight down from above the trees, landing on the trail in a spray of dirt and rocks. The Urgles shouted with alarm, and yanked on their horses' reins. The animals went stiff-legged and collided into each other, but the Urgles quickly untangled themselves to face Safira with bared weapons. Hate crossed their faces as they glared at her. There were twelve of them, all ugly, jeering brutes. Aragorn wondered why they did not flee. He had thought that the sight of Safira would frighten them away. Why are they waiting? Are they going to attack us or not? He was shot when the largest Urgle advanced and spat. Our master wishes to speak with you, human. The monster spoke in deep, 
groaning gutturals. It's a trap, warned Safira before Aragon could say anything. Don't listen to him. At least let's find out what he has to say, he reasoned, Cur curious but extremely wary. Who is your master? he asked. The Urgul sneered. His name does not deserve to be given to one as low as yourself. He rules the sky and holds dominance over the earth. You are no more than a stray ant to him. Yet he has decreed that you shall be brought before him alive. Take heart that you have become worthy of such notice. I'll never go with you, nor any of my enemies, declared Aragorn thinking of Yezowak. Whether you serve Shade, Urgul, or some twisted fiend I've not heard of, I've no wish to parley with him. That is a grave mistake, growled the Urgul, showing his fangs. There is no way to escape him. Eventually, you will stand before our master. If you resist, he will fill your days with agony. Aragorn wondered who had the power to bring the Urgles under one banner. Was there a third great force loose in the land, along with the Empire and the Varden? Keep your offer, and tell your master that the crows can eat his entrails for all I care. Rage swept through the Urgles. Their leader howled, gnashing his teeth. We'll drag you to him, then! He waved his arm, and the Urgles rushed at Safira, Raising his right hand, Aragorn barked. Jirda! No! cried Safira, but it was too late. The monsters faltered as Aragorn's palm glowed. Beams of light lanced from his hand, striking each of them in the gut. The Urgles were thrown through the air and smashed into trees, falling senseless to the ground. Fatigue suddenly drained Aragorn of strength, and he tumbled off Safira. His mind felt hazy and dull. As Safira bent over him, he realised that he might have gone too far. The energy needed to lift and throw twelve urgles was enormous. Fear engulfed him as he struggled to stay conscious. At the edge of his vision, he saw one of the urgles stagger to his feet, sword in hand. Aragorn tried to warn Safira, but he was too weak. No, oh, he thought feebly. The urgle crept towards Safira until he was well past her tail then raised his sword to strike her neck. No! Safira whirled on the monster, roaring savagely. Her talons slashed with blinding speed. Blood spurted everywhere as the Urgul was rent in two. Safira snapped her jaws together with finality and returned to Aragorn. She gently wrapped her bloody claws around his torso, then growled and jumped into the air. The night blurred into a pain-filled streak. The hypnotic sound of Safira's wings put him in a bleary trance. Up, down, up, down, up, down. When Safira eventually landed, Aragorn was dimly aware of Brom talking with her. Aragorn could not understand what they said, but a decision must have been reached because Safira took off again. His stupor yielded to sleep that covered him like a soft blanket.